united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Good morning. My name is Mike Woods, and I am here today to serve as your teacher with United for Christ from KSCE TV. By way of greeting to you, in addition to what I've already given, I want to say Happy Thanksgiving. And please remember what the Word of God says in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God's will for us is that we not simply thank Him on one day of the year, but we have a lifestyle of rejoicing in Him, praising Him, and thanking Him. Last week, we looked at John chapter 15, beginning with verse 18 and through verse 27. If you have your Bible, please open it to John's Gospel, the 15th chapter. I'm going to give a brief review of what we discovered last week. The main idea in these verses is that following Jesus Christ invites rejection and persecution. Now, that's not a very popular doctrine, but it's a badly neglected doctrine in the church of our Lord. We need to consider it and look at why the world persecutes us here, according to what Jesus says in Matthew 15, verses 18 and following. The first reason is given quickly in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Jesus is said to have come into the world, which was made through him, and the world did not know him, and those who were of his own family did not know him. His siblings basically rejected Jesus as the Messiah. We also know that because we are associated with Christ and identified with Him closely, we'll be like Him. And in being like Him, we too will not be accepted by the world. To be more blunt, we will be rejected by the world. And there's the second reason in verse 19. If you are of the world the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Everyone whom Jesus was speaking to at this time, all the eleven of the apostles, were once of the world, in the world. And as long as we are in the world, we're like the world. We have the same weaknesses the world has, the lust of the flesh, the lust of of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. Those are the three broad categories. And we behave like the world. And the world, when we behave like them, doesn't see any threat coming our way. Jesus talks about this, about himself, and then by implication about us in John 3, 19 and 20. I'm going to paraphrase it. What he says about himself, when the light comes in the world, then the world retreats because it hates the light, because of the wickedness, the evil that is associated with the world. So you can see why the world would reject us once we have come to know Jesus and remember what Jesus says about us after we come to know Him. He says, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When we get to know Jesus, He comes to indwell us, and by virtue of His being the light of the world, He lets that light shine in our hearts, but not simply in our hearts, but through our lives. And this is an irritation at least to the world if not something that calls them to retaliate against us because we expose them. 
The third reason is given in verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, namely what he says up in verse 20, if they persecuted me, they will also per persecute you. The world persecutes us because it does not know the one who sent Jesus. That's what Jesus says. If they knew the Father, and the only way to know the Father, of course, would be through Jesus. He is the way, the only way. The result is that they don't care for us either. So that's a rather bleak picture, isn't it? If we're going to follow Christ, we're going to suffer persecution. But that's just part of the story. That's the preliminary. That's just the description of what it means to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's glance down to chapter 16, begin with verse 14, verse 1 in chapter, chapter 16 of John. These things I have spoken to you that you may be kept from stumbling. You see, Jesus is preparing the apostles for the inevitable. After he has died for their sins, he's raised from the dead, he's spent several weeks with them before ascending back to heaven. And before the Holy Spirit comes, he's warning them about what they will experience. They will be experiencing difficulty. And he did not want them to feel like they had been left out in the cold by him because he has given them the Spirit on Pentecost, that great day when the church was formed by the Spirit of God. When Peter preached that great sermon and the Holy Spirit fell in power in saving 3,000 people in one day. Notice what he goes on to say in John 16 too. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. This would be people who are of the world. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Now pause just a moment. Let's think about what happened after Pentecost, that wonderful day, that glorious day. The new found church was basking in the glory of coming to know God most intimately when the Holy Spirit came to live in their lives and save them. And so, as time unfolded, <coughs> excuse me, there was <clears throat> the pushback that Jesus predicted. <clears throat> excuse me. And the prediction came true early. You remember Stephen? Stephen was selected by the church by the direction of the Spirit of God to be one of what we would call a deacon, the first one and one of the leaders of those seven who led the church in the area of serving widows, taking care of them so the elders and the apostles could do their work of teaching. Well, Stephen was brought before the Sanhedrin, the governing body, and he was talking about the history of his people and their people. And as long as he was talking about the good things and not challenging them at all, the result was that they were listening and probably nodding and agreeing when they had asked him to tell them about why he was following the Messiah. But when he got to the point of talking about Jesus, he rather directly spoke to them about how they were involved in the crucifixion of our Lord, and it infuriated them. And what did they do? They stoned him to death. And not too long after that, we don't know exactly how long, one of the apostles, James, the brother of John, they were sons of Zebedee, James was beheaded at the demand of Herod, and Herod thought he could get more favor with the rank and file Jew and the leaders of Judaism by killing James, by beheading him. So persecution broke out early in the church. And as it says here, they will make you outcasts from the synagogue and so forth. Now, turn with me but now to the book of Matthew chapter 5. You probably are familiar with the Beatitudes in Matthew. And the last of the eight Beatitudes is found 
in verse 9. Look at verse 9. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Jesus predicted this persecution when he gave what would be considered the ordination sermon for the apostles, the Sermon on the Mount. So this is not the first time in John 15, is not the first time that Jesus speaks of the coming persecution in the church. Just last week, there was a feature on Fox and Friends on the Fox Network, and the guest speaker was Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham and the leader of Samaritan's Purse. And Franklin was reporting how last week on the 16th of November, there was a delegation from an organization simply known as Aid to Christians in Need. And this presentation was made in the Parliament of Great Britain. And it related how in the last two years there has been an inordinate increase in persecution of believers, especially on the continents of Asia and Africa and in the Middle East. And the persecution has resulted in all kinds of trouble. Some have been killed. Many have been marginalized and kicked out of their families because in the case of those who are Muslims who have come to know Christ, they have left their faith and their families have felt obligated to see that they were killed unless they repented. This has become normal. This has become awful in that region. <clears throat> and we need to be concerned about those who are part of our body to pray for them and to plead for them and to speak up for them through avenues that God has given us to do so. So what does the Word of God say about us? When we are people who have been persecuted for the sake of the gospel, we are blessed. How does that work? We've been blessed because we identify with a special group of people. Look at verse 11 again of Matthew 5. We are identified because we have become like the prophets of old. Look at verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now does this mean that we should go out and try to be obnoxious and be rude to people and offend them so that they will attack us and persecute us? Not at all. In fact, we are to be people who are not only light but salt. Our conversation should be sprinkled with salt. That's what Paul talks about in Colossians 3. Let your conversation be winsome, gracious, sprinkled, or scattered with salt. Salt is that which gives flavor to things, isn't it? Salt is that which makes some foods worthy of eating. I cannot imagine eating something without salt. Even fruit sometimes I use salt on, and it enhances the flavor of even fruit. Well, we are to be people who bring a flavor into the world that's sorely lacking and deep down, deeply desired. And that is the salt. Jesus says we are the salt of the earth. So we're not to go looking for trouble or try to make trouble. We're just to follow Christ. And as we saw last week from John 15, 26 and 27, Jesus says the helper, the Holy Spirit, will come to you because I will send him to you and he will bear witness of me. Now the question is, 
Through whom will he bear witness of himself? Well, it will be none other than you and I. By just being a nice person, it's not likely that we're going to be persecuted. It comes with our sharing the gospel. We cannot help but want to tell people about Jesus Christ. Do you remember, if you know Jesus, what you wanted to do after Jesus answered your prayer for forgiveness and you yielded to Him as your Lord and He came into your life? I remember what I wanted to do. I was a schoolboy at the time. I went to my teacher, I'll never forget her name, Mrs. Tedder, and I told her that I had come to know Jesus the day before it was a Monday morning. And I was so excited and she was so kind to me. I don't know if she was a Christian, but she was sweet to me. She didn't reject me for that. But as time went by and I began to mature and I began to hang out with people who were adults, I began to witness to them, share Christ with them. And they found it offensive at times, and they let me know, even to this day. Sometimes when I share Christ, people are very positively negative if there's such a thing, and they just say, I don't believe in that. Don't speak to me like that. I remember one time when I approached a man who was in a bar, I was not there to drink alcohol, but I was there on assignment from my seminary class in Fort Worth, Texas to witness to people in bars in the city of Fort Worth. I sat down beside the man. I ordered a Coke. A friend of mine on the other side, my classmate, I said, I'll take the lead here. I told him that before we went in on the first person and I said something to him about Jesus, something to the effect, have you come to the place in your life that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? And he looked at me rather sternly, and he said, don't talk to me about Jesus in this place. Well, that was the end of that conversation, but you understand that the world is not favorably disposed to our telling them about Christ and their need for Him. And sometimes they reject us. Well, in the remaining moments, I'm going to ask you to turn to Philippians. Philippians is a little later here in the New Testament. And we're going to look at the Apostle Paul. You know, Paul was in prison when he wrote the book of Philippians. He was on death row as far as he knew. He was an old man in his 60s. That was his own description. In another letter he wrote at the same time to Philemon, an aged man. He had eye trouble. He was alone most of the time. He could not have visitors except on special occasions. And so what we need to remember, his situation was a difficult situation there. But he had the grace of God with him. It's been said that the letter of Philippians is a letter of joy through and through. And it is. Let's look what he says to the Philippian church. In verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And he goes on to say, I have learned the secret of being content in each and every situation. Are you like that? Are you a person who spontaneously praises God when you face difficulty, who resorts quickly to thanking God for the difficulties in your life when people are mistreating you, when you're experiencing hardship as the Apostle Paul was when he wrote this to the Philippian believers? Well, how is that possible? It's possible because of one line in the fifth verse of Philippians 4. Look at it. 
the Lord is near. Think about this. Paul in prison, he was not really alone, was he? Because the Lord Jesus Christ was with him. And that enabled him to rejoice in the Lord. And he commands us. This is the Holy Spirit's desire for us that we praise the Lord all the while. And what happens when that occurs is that the devil has to flee because God is enthroned on the praises of his people. The Bible says in Psalm 16, 11, in your presence there is fullness of joy and in your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Where are we if we know Jesus? The Bible says, these are the words of Jesus, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them. This shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Our residence is in the hand, as it were, of the God-man, Jesus Christ, the place of ultimate security, ultimate safety, ultimate joy. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, David said, than to dwell in the place of wickedness. God has given us more than a place as a doorkeeper in the temple of God. We're part of the temple of God now, the temple of Christ in the church of Jesus Christ, and He lives in us. So we can rejoice always, and we can be gentle. How could you be gentle when you're in trouble? How could you be gentle, gentle as Paul and Silas were when they were being beaten for really nothing of consequence in Philippi, singing praises. And when the jail broke loose because of the earthquake and the man who was keeping the jail was scared to death, he's about to kill himself, Paul came out and said, don't do it. And the man said, what must I do to be saved? What had caused him to want to know? He'd heard them singing hymns to the Lord and praising the Lord. And they saw this man see their gentleness and give his life to Jesus. And he was a, one of those who read this letter to the Philippians. He well understood it. And then here's the other thing. Do not always pray to the Lord in everything with prayer. The word prayer really is a word for praise and supplication. That's asking for things. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Here we are at thanksgiving. Paul was giving thanks in prison, telling us in a way, not knowing this would get to us 2,000 years later, but he was saying, rejoice in the Lord always. We have a great reason to, don't we? This is the thing that Jesus says, when we are persecuted for the sake of righteousness and because of our identification with Jesus Christ, that persecution lends itself to validating our witness by the way we respond, by praising the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord as we trust in Him with all our heart. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, is what Paul says a little later in this same chapter. And so we must remember that as we come to this Thanksgiving season. My prayer for myself and for you is that we do indeed as Christ has called us to do, to rejoice in Him and praise Him and thank Him for all that He does for us. One of the early figures of church history was a man named Polycarp. Polycarp had been a Christian for over 70 years. He was arrested. He was the Bishop of Smyrna, and he was arrested by the authorities, taking him to the arena where if he did not repent of his following Christ and give honor to Caesar, who was a recognized emperor and God of the Roman Empire, he would be burned at the stake and thrown to the wild animals there, ravenous animals. And he said, how could I deny my Christ who has been so good to me all these 70 plus years and dishonor him who has been faithful to me all along? 
Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you trusted in Him alone for your salvation? Do you understand that Christ was all God in all man, perfect in His humanity and in His deity, and He died on the cross for you? He was the only acceptable sacrifice because He Himself lived a perfect life. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And my invitation to you today, if you do not know Jesus, know that He laid down His life for you, paid for your sins, so that you could know God through Him and have eternal life. If you'd like to receive Christ today, there's no day like today to know the Lord Jesus who can take a life that is wandering, hurting, and give that life His joy. That is my hope for you. Would you pray with me as we conclude our time together today? Dear Father, I thank you for your love for us shown most clearly in the person of your Son, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you loved us so much. You laid down your life for us. And we come to you asking you to forgive us of our sin, Lord. Come to live in our lives. Take control of our lives. And give us eternal life. At the same time, help us, Lord, to walk with you, especially in times of difficulty and trouble, when people reject us, even family members, when we follow Christ. Encourage us. Help us to follow the example and the teaching of Philippians 4, given by Apostle Paul. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.